but all of that changed in October 2000. What happened in October 2000? That is the day that China and the United States agreed on the conditions of China joining WTO. Before China was a member of WTO, it needed an annual agreement by the U.S. Congress that its goods could go enter into the U.S. pay no more higher tariff than other countries. That was known as the most favored nation status. Because it needs this uh, approval every year, that meant that China's growth could be stopped at any time if U.S. Congress would say no to MFA. So that's why China works very hard to push to get that. If you're in the textile business, or the toy business, or the shoe business, fashion is very important. You cannot sell this year's fashion next year. So when you invest something in China, you also invest something in Southeast Asia. So in case China doesn't get MFN, you can export from Southeast Asian facility. And because of the FDI, uh, that's operating in Malaysia, it created a, a, a demand for inputs so local manufacturers could uh, uh, invest to supply, to be part of the, the supply chain. But after 2001, when China was guaranteed entry to the US market, there was no need to diversify FDI to Southeast Asia. They just all go to China. So what happened was, the negative effects of capital flights, brain drain, that were not seen before 2000, because we had this FDI making up for it. Once the FDI doesn't come, the effects of the negative brain drain and capital flight show themselves. And so what could be done? Basically, no amount of fiscal stimulus could restore growth to Malaysia, just like no amount of fiscal stimulus could restore growth to the United States. What that is needed is structural adjustment. Things need to be done differently. When you think about it, for those of you who run companies, can you think of running your company, doing exactly what you did 40 years ago, unchanged policies. But this is how this country is being run. NDP is 40 years old. It started at a time when the rest of the world was, when half the world was shut up of the international economic system. But now, globalization, capital is mobile internationally, human talents are mobile internationally, so the result is you got to adopt a form of uh, of growth policies that are able to eradicate poverty without causing capital flight and brain drain. So I think the first the, uh, 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 a rethinking. And we could see that the government realizes it. The new economic model that was proposed was a recognition. But uh, since this is something that is still being uh, debated over, we would have to wait to see how time comes. There are three things that clearly needs to be done. One is you've got to remove the tax rate on growth. Yes, Najib did that, the first thing he did, he has drastically removed, changed the 30% rule and it is effectively 12.5% now, instead of 30%. 12.5% is lower than 30, but it is higher than zero, which is the case elsewhere. <laughs> Unless Thailand, Indonesia, India and China starts putting 12.5% tax on their growth, then we will be okay. As long as they maintain 0%, we are at a disadvantage. 
So that's one of the, the first thing is, and the second thing is, we cannot compete on the basis of cheap labor anymore. We even have to import maids. In fact, we want everybody to be not just a pair of hands, but be complete, but, the, but be brain power roles. Basically, you, sh you should think of computers in parallel processing. We need to boost the human capital of this country. And to boost it, you clearly have to have jobs whereby these people could take. And what it means is you got to put efforts into creating and transfer of new technologies. When it comes to creating new technologies, one thing you do know is that smart people do not like to work under people who they feel are considerably less talented than themselves. And so how could you retain world-class talent? Even if you tell them you pay only 10% income tax rather than 15, I think when they look at the future, career path, that is a blockage to growth. What we need is to have national mobilization, where it comes across the following ways. Just like there are very few countries that have denied education to their women that have grown successfully. Because you deny education to your women, you are basically competing with the rest of the world with half a brain. <laughs> and if you deny leadership positions, position of responsibility to 25% of the population, 30% of the population, then you are at most thinking with two-thirds of your brain. National mobilization means you've got to think 100% of your brains. I think we've got to have a policy, a kind of a policy that promotes knowledge lab growth. So improving the universities are important. The tragedy is that our, we have succeeded in building a country and yet our institutions of higher learning are meant to be political instruments rather than economic instruments. We are more concerned about what language they are taught in rather than the content of what is being taught. So, if the education is, is, a big, is, is a big thing. The other thing that is useful for Malaysia to think about is how is to recognize that one of the reasons why China was able to grow so fast is that each of the provincial government, government is promoted on the basis of how much improvements in standard of living is able to bring to the state. In order to give each government the incentive to improve the living standard in his state, he is allowed a certain amount of local revenue that he could use to address questions of infrastructure. Right now, in Malaysia, we often talk about the social compact among the races. What we forget is the compact among the states in the constitution of 1957. Each state was allowed to borrow on international markets for infrastructure construction. But that right has been removed. Basically, Malaysia has reduced the number of centers of policy initiative down to the EPU. If you think about Malaysian industrialization, it really began in 1970. It began in 1970 because Kim Jong Il was not optimistic that he could get much from his good friend Tan Siu Sin for infrastructure investment in Penang. So what did he do? He went out and invited the multinationals in. And when that succeeded, all the other military Versailles just did what he did. Right? Hardware failure. What does that consist of? You look at what other people do and you do the same. So in Malaysia, we ought to have more 